Hello and welcome to the HistoryNetwork.org podcast, Season 21, Episode 6, The Siege of Khartoum and the Death of Gordon. Northern Sudan had always been under the control of the Ottoman-administered Egypt, though from the early part of the 19th century, the now almost autonomous Egypt extended her rule south. Muhammad Ali, the self-declared Khedive of Egypt, garrisoned troops throughout the region at outposts such as Khartoum. Soon the busy garrison town was a thriving settlement, the focal point for trade, including slave trade. Khartoum was positioned in the hot desert climate, arid for most of the year. In no month did the temperature drop below 30 degrees Celsius or 86 degrees Fahrenheit. It was bordered to the east by the Blue Nile and the west by the White Nile. In the intervening years, bureaucratic Egyptian control had alienated the population. In the 1850s, secular courts had been introduced, and a state-sponsored mosque-building programme further eroded local religious practices. Slave trading was the engine of the local economy, and from the 1860s it was gradually suppressed. Grandiose schemes of Khedive Ishmael in the middle of the 19th century resulted in high taxes and the almost collapse of Egypt under the burden of debt. It's at this point the British government stepped in, buying the controlling share of the Suez Canal from the Egyptians and repaying the Khedive's debts. It was during this period Khedive Ishmael engaged the British Army officer General Charles Gordon as governor of the equatorial provinces of Sudan. He had initially been offered a salary of £10,000, but Gordon refused and suggested a more modest £2,000. To put that in perspective, in today's money £10,000 would equate to around $1 million. His task was to expand Egyptian control southward. Ishmael's mismanagement would not continue to be tolerated by the British, and he was forced to resign in favour of his son Tafik. With his political support gone, exhausted from years in the field, Gordon resigned. He knew he could not count on the British to support him in the Sudan. The Foreign Secretary, Earl Granville, had made it clear Her Majesty's Government had no interest in getting involved in the region. Such resentment against foreign rulers and simmering tensions made for a fertile recruiting ground for Mohammed Ahmed, who proclaimed himself the Mahdi and openly revolted. An Egyptian-led attempt to quash the revolt failed, so in 1883, with British consent, the Egyptians organised a second attempt commanded by a retired British Indian Army officer, Colonel William Hicks. It proved to be another debacle, with Winston Churchill later describing it as perhaps the worst army that has ever marched to war. On paper, it looked sound. 7,000 infantry, 1,000 cavalry, 20 machine guns and artillery, all commanded by 12 European officers. But the force was untrained. It lacked any real form of discipline, not aided by the lack of pay. Hicks himself had little faith in his small army and tried to put off going into the field, but the Egyptian government would not hear of it. Marching into enemy territory, either by mistake or their guides leading them astray, they found themselves surrounded. The ranks of the Mahdi had swelled with up to 40,000 warriors, and these were motivated and well drilled. The Egyptian forces started to desert in their droves, when battle looked imminent. And when the battle came, it was a massacre, with only around 500 Egyptians managing to escape the slaughter. Back in Britain, the Prime Minister, William Gladstone, was faced with the dilemma, should he send in a British force to quell and conquer the Sudan, or abandon the territory to the Mahdi? Any military operation was going to be difficult in the face of such a popular uprising, and they were revolting against Egyptian suppression and colonialism, which had always received little support from London. 
The decision was taken to abandon the Sudan, but not before all British interests could be safely withdrawn. The first error on the part of the British government lay in the appointment of Charles Gordon to head the expedition, organising the withdrawal. Gordon was the fifth generation of his family to enter the British Army. He had attended the Royal Military College at Woolwich, an institution which held up his military career by two years when they held him back from graduation for insubordination. He was commissioned as second lieutenant in the Royal Engineers in 1852. He saw service in the Crimea and made a name for himself during the Taiping Rebellion in China. He was a deeply religious man with a Victorian missionary zeal for spreading the word. He was a curious choice for such a mission. Philip Magnus, one of Gladstone's biographers, described Gordon as fearless, erratic, brilliant, perverse, always notoriously undisciplined. He exercised an extraordinary fascination over his fellow countrymen. Indeed, in January of 1884, when pressed for an interview by the Pall Mall Gazette, he claimed, The danger arises from the influence which the spectacle of a conquering Muslim power established close to your frontiers will exercise upon the population which you govern. In all the cities of Egypt it will be felt that what the Mahdi has done they may do, and, as he has driven out the intruder, they may do the same. In essence, putting forward, if the Sudan falls, Egypt might fall to the Mahdi. There was a public outcry, led by the press, to send Chinese Gordon to the Sudan, but this flew in the face of liberal policy at the time. Gladstone had won the election on imperial retrenchment. By the end of January, the government had bent to pressure and decided to send Gordon to the Sudan, but with a limited mandate to assess the situation and advise of the best means of evacuation. British Consul General in Cairo, Evelyn Baring, was far from impressed, reporting to London, a man who habitually consults the prophet Isaiah when he is in difficulty is not apt to obey the orders of anyone. Gordon certainly seems to be inconsistent. He talked to the press about being allowed to smash up the Mahdi, yet at the same time makes the error of informing tribes in the north of Sudan of the forthcoming withdrawal, the consequences of which was those tribes once loyal now switched sides. He arrived in Khartoum on the 18th of February 1884. In passing through Egypt, the Khedive had reappointed him Governor-General of Sudan, a role perhaps at odds with those of the British government. Women and children were evacuated, but the situation of evacuating the garrisons was complicated by the fact they were scattered across the country. Some were already under siege, and any relief attempt would have been made through hostile territory. Any sortie from those besieged would likely end in failure. He now dallied, claiming to London a lack of boats had slowed the withdrawal. At the same time, he began organising the defence of Khartoum. It was the largest settlement and had the greatest concentration of Egyptian and European troops, greater than the other garrisons combined. The position was strong, with rivers on two sides and fortifications looking out across the desert. They stockpiled enough food for six months and ammunition was plentiful. The civilians in the city walls were supportive, especially when he relaxed the laws on slavery, laws he had previously sanctioned. Gordon now attempted to justify his position by making all his dispatches to London available to the press and allowing the Times of London journalist free access. The public were well appraised of the situation. Indeed, the Times reported... We are daily expecting British troops. We cannot bring ourselves to believe that we are to be abandoned. As the tribes to the north switched sides, it became impossible to keep the road open. With the surrender of the garrison at Berber in May, Khartoum became completely isolated. In London, the government dug their heels in. Gordon had gone against their orders and the stated policy. But would the public accept the abandonment of a national hero? The answer would be no. 
The press clamoured in his support. Even the Queen demanded help should be sent. But the Cabinet remained split throughout the summer on what course of action to take. Interestingly, it should have come as no surprise to Gordon, the reaction in London. Gordon noted in his diary, I own to having been very insubordinate to Her Majesty's Government and its officials, but it is my nature and I cannot help it. I fear I have not even tried to play battledore and shuttlecock with them. I know if I was chief I would never employ myself, for I am incorrigible. He had 7,000 troops with him and 27,000 civilians in the city. Beyond the walls the Mali had mustered around 30,000 soldiers. A trained engineer, Gordon understood defences and the city was turned into a fortress. Additionally, Gordon had guns and armoured plating attached to the paddle-wheel steamers stationed at Khartoum to create his own private river navy. In March 1884, the city was cut off. An early sortie out beyond the walls proved to be a failure, so the defenders settled in for a long siege. Their only hope was a relief column being sent. Though the telegraph lines had been cut, runners were able to slip through the Mardi lines, and London was aware of the situation, as was the public. As Gladstone vacillated, the numbers of Mardi troops only increased around the city. As March turned into April, May into June, and then finally in July, London authorised an expedition to relieve the beleaguered city. The Nile expedition, commanded by Sir Garnet Wolseley, took time to organise. It was to be a 1,600-mile journey. It was decided the quickest way would be via the Nile, and a number of Royal Navy whalers were modified for the trip. Each could carry just a dozen men and supplies for a hundred days. Canadian voyagers, traders used to transporting goods and materials long distances across water courses, were hired to help navigate the Nile. These were hired in Canada, again another delay to the mission. But Wolseley had used them previously and insisted upon their usefulness, though he could have easily called upon the services of Egyptian boatmen who knew the Nile to assist with the boats. All this took time, and the force of 5,400 men didn't get under way until October of 1884, and by now Khartoum had been under siege for six months. Progress was painfully slow. Boats had to be hauled up rapids, and man-handling these ten-metre-long, two-metre-wide craft through the shallows took time. Gordon was robust in his defence. The streams for months plied the Nile almost unhindered, which suggests, if Gordon really wanted to, a method of withdrawal was still open to him, but he stoically held on. But it was diminishing returns for Gordon and his men. Successive small raids by his steamers wore down his forces, which could not be replaced. In September 1844, 1,000 of his men were ambushed while undertaking a raid. A week later, the rebels captured a steamer. All on board were killed, including the French consul and the Times journalist whom Gordon had sent to Cairo to plead for relief. A large number of Krupp's artillery pieces had been captured during the disastrous Hicks expedition. These were now put to good use. A series of forts were constructed along the river bank, which slowly denied the British steamers free access to the rivers. The pre-prepared earthworks and defences around the city, which had so far repelled all attacks, became the target for steady bombardment, gradually wearing down their effectiveness. By the close of 1884, conditions in the city were dreadful. Starvation was rife. Any animal that could be eaten was gone. Horses, donkeys, cats and dogs. Gordon offered the civilian population free passage out of the city if they wished to take their chances. Over half the inhabitants chose to do so. Though Gordon himself was not for going, even when the Mahdi offered him safe passage out of Khartoum and the Sudan, we have written to you to go back to your country. I repeat to you the words of Allah. Do not destroy yourself. Allah himself is merciful to you. One has to question his state of mind when he wrote in his diary. If an emissary or letter comes up here ordering me to come down, I will not obey it, but will stay here and fall with the town.
Gordon pleaded with Wolseley to hurry. In November, he suggested they could only hold out another 40 days. The relief force was split into two columns, with two and a half thousand men being sent by camel over the desert, led by Major General Sir Herbert Stewart. Though this was not without mishap, a short battle at Abu Kli caused the British some 76 killed. Yet from their square, the stout British defence caused over a thousand rebels killed, of which the Scottish poet William McGonagall would pen, Ye sons of Mars, come join with me, and sing in praise of Sir Herbert Stuart's little army, that made ten thousand Arabs flee at the charge of the bayonet at Abu Kli. But this was all too late for Gordon. His last entry in his journal, dated the 14th of December, 1884, read, Now mark this, if the expeditionary force, and I ask for no more than 200 men, does not come in ten days, the town may fall, and I have done my best for the honour of our country. Goodbye. Just two days before Stuart's relief column reached Khartoum, it fell. The defences of the city had slowly been overwhelmed. In December, Gordon had been forced to withdraw his outposts across the White Nile at Omdurman. The assault on the city was hastened by the approach of the relief force. The Mahdi force was overwhelming, with 50,000 men. They were split into two columns. The first was ordered to wade across the White Nile, whose water had receded over the winter months, to attack the city's walls, while the other force assaulted the Masalamite Gate. The night of the 25th, 26th January, the attackers overwhelmed the exhausted garrison. No quarter was given, and approximately 7,000 defenders were butchered. Though the Mahdi had expressly ordered that Gordon be taken alive, he was struck down in the fighting. Accounts of his death vary, with some reports stating he was killed at the governor's palace, while others claim he was shot in the streets while trying to escape to the Austrian consulate. In either case, Gordon's body was decapitated and taken to the Mahdi on a pike. The lead elements arrived just two days after the city had fallen. Wolseley now ordered a retreat, abandoning Sudan to the Mahdi. The actual circumstances of Gordon's death are unknown. Was he speared, refusing to fight, or gunned down in the street while making his way to the Austrian consulate? The best known account is from his bodyguard 13 years later. From this we get the famous painting of Gordon stood at the top of the palace steps with a crowd of tribesmen clawing their way up as he stands at the top, pistol in hand. Khalil Aga Ofali stated he and Gordon had retreated up the stairs. Gordon had been injured but fought on with sword and pistol until cut down. Britain was stunned. The public blamed Gladstone's administration and in March 1885 the government fell. Would you like to write a script for us here at the History Network? Some of our most popular scripts have been written by our listeners. If you've got an idea for a script you'd like to write for us, or if you'd just like to see us cover a subject that you're interested in, then just drop us a line at info at thehistorynetwork.org. We are always very grateful to receive your emails. Thanks for listening. You've been listening to the historynetwork.org podcast, written by Angus Wallace, read by Nick Barker.